wonderful singing. And uh, we are grateful that we can exalt the name of Jesus in this place. Well, one of the timeless truths about God that I cherish is that he always finishes what he has started. When he begins something, you can always count on it that he will complete it without fail. God will never abandon his work at a halfway mark. I do that, and perhaps you do that. Remember when he began creating the universe? He didn't quit on the second day or the third day. God worked faithfully until everything he wanted to create was completed. And the Bible says, God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. That was on the sixth day. Well, in a small way today, I would like to follow in the footsteps of, of the Lord my God to present to you the concluding part of the message I received from him to deliver to you. In my previous message here at a mission, we began looking at the Bible's teaching regarding the blessedness of forgiveness. David, the man of God, the man after God's own heart, the prophet of God, the sweet psalmist of Israel, and the king of Israel shares his personal experience of being forgiven in Psalm 32. This message from Psalm 32 is relevant to us today, especially as we approach the season of celebrating the death and burial and resurrection of the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did Jesus die on a cruel Roman cross? Well, he died and rose again so that all who put their trust in him will experience, first of all, the forgiveness of God, the favor of God, the freedom of God, the fullness of God, and become privileged members of the family of God, bearing fruit for God. Does your life bear a sparkling testimony to all these blessings and benefits? Well, the heart of the message in Psalm 32, verse 1 to 5, is simply this. It's a message of hope as we sang in this worship time. Our hope is in God. Why? Because he has something special for you and me. So the message, the heart of the message from Psalm 32, verse 1 to 5, is simply this. God faithfully and fully forgives those who honestly and humbly confess their sin to him. As such, the first lesson presented to us in this psalm is about David's proclamation of the blessedness of forgiveness. In fact, there is no other place in all of the Bible where a believer heartily expresses abounding joy, true happiness, for the blessing of experiencing forgiveness of God. You will only see in this psalm, there's no other psalm like it, where a believer heartily and happily expresses his joy, his gladness, about being forgiven of his sins. David held nothing back in expressing his joy of experiencing and enjoying the full blessing of God's forgiveness. What a day it was in David's life. Guess what? That experience is not just for David. It's not just reserved for David. You and I can also experience that as well, even today. Now, please, if you have your Bibles, turn them to Psalm 32, verse 1 to 5. Will you please listen carefully as I recite this passage from the updated New American Standard Bible? Listen carefully to what the Bible says to us in that passage. It says, a psalm of David, a masculine. How blessed is he whose, for, whose transgression is forgiven whose sin is covered. Remember we just sang that you have covered all my sin. 
We just say that. Just leave it there, please. <laughs> he says, whose sin is covered. How blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity and in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. Scylla. No, not, not Scylla yet. My vitality, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Scylla. I acknowledge my sin to you. My iniquity I did not hide. I said I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And you forgave the guilt of my sin. Selah. Well, earlier David had expressed, as I stated earlier, the joy of God's forgiveness. From David's song, we learn that blessedness is forgiven, is to be forgiven. Blessedness is to be forgiven. I want you to say it with me. Blessedness is to be forgiven. You see, for, to be forgiven is an emotion that dis, defies description. If you accept it, it is a, a cloud nine experience. It's like walking on air. But you see, there was a time in David's life when he didn't have a cloud nine experience of enjoying the, the forgiveness of God. The Bible now brings us to the po point or the time in David's life when he was trying hard to hide his sins. It takes a great deal of hard work to cover up your sin. And a good dose of pain goes along with it. So David now, led by the Holy Spirit himself, tells us or relates to us his painful experiences of concealing his sin. This is what verses 3 to 4 are all about. The Bible says, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Silla. Now, Proverbs chapter 28, verse 13 Bluntly and boldly says, he who conceals his transgressions will not prosper. David found these words to be true in his own life. When David chose not to pour out all his corruption before God in confession, he only experienced pain, not peace, torture, not tranquility, groaning, not gladness, judgment, not joy. Brightness of soul, not delight of soul. A burning within him, not a blessing. Agony, not the approval of God. A feeling of uneasiness, not a feeling of uninhibited joy. He experienced restlessness, not relief. Perhaps you are there today because you are concealing your sin. You are not experiencing Relief, rather restlessness. You see, after David had committed adultery with Bathsheba and plotted the death of Uriah, the husband of Bathsheba, he stubbornly and steadfastly refused to confess his sin. He tried to sweep it all under the rug, as we all often do. David was congratulating himself. Nobody here knows what I've done. Nobody knows about my sin. I've hidden it pretty well. Moreover, David lived in a time when news didn't spread like wildfire as it does in our day, full of news media, newspapers, Facebook, Twitter, and the internet. So David was comfortable and carried on 
with his life as the king of Israel. Days turn into weeks, weeks into months, and months into a year, and David has still not confessed his sin. Now the question is, why do you think David will refuse to confess his sin for so long? Well, your guess is as good as mine. Perhaps David's pride and ego got the better part of him. That's why people don't confess their sin. Pride. Perhaps David rationalized that time heals all things. Isn't that what we also think? Time heals all things, and therefore I'm not going to, I'm going to hide this sin. Because hopefully time will heal all things. Perhaps David thought he could get by with this one. After all, to this point in his life, David had lived a pretty good life. He had killed Goliath as a shepherd boy when all the army of Israel under King Saul would not venture to take on Goliath. He had won battle after battle for Israel. He had defeated the Philistines, one of the one of Israel's most hated enemies in back-to-back -back battles. With all these accomplishments and more, could he not get by with the sin he had been, he had been hiding? Had he not done enough good to be let off the hook on this matter? Perhaps you may be saying, I love Jesus. I walk with Jesus. I follow Jesus. I serve Jesus and I live for Jesus. Can't, can't I hide or get by with the sin I'm hiding right now in my life? Because I'm serving Jesus. Well, may I solemnly say to you, if you are a true believer in Jesus Christ, a genuine born again believer, believer, you can sin and I can sin but you cannot get by with it, and I cannot get by with, with it. You see, that is the difference between the believer and the unbeliever. If you are a man of the world or a woman of the world, that is, if you are unsaved, you can get by with your sin, listen, temporarily. <laughs> but a true child of God, a genuine Christian, cannot. Why? God's hand of discipline will be heavy upon you. I tell you, friends, God takes his own child to the woodshed for discipline. And he does so in love, even though it may be painful to you and to me. Perhaps some of you are already in the woodshed of God for discipline. Because God loves you, and he will not let you live in your sin or continue to live in your sin. He wants to draw you out of a life of sin, a life of being controlled by sin, in order to allow the Spirit to work in you and for you to reflect his son, Jesus Christ. The Bible shows us that in David's stubborn refusal to acknowledge his sin, he was fighting against God and against his own best interests. How many of you have fought God with God and won? You want when you... Okay, we'll talk about that later. <laughs> David, David was fighting against God and against his own best interest. He became a physical wreck. And it was all caused by his unrelieved anguish of spirit. He realized that God's hand was heavy upon him, blocking him, thwarting him, frustrating him at every turn. Nothing worked out right anymore for David. The gears of life never meshed for David. The carefree days had vanished, and continued existence was unappealing as a dry desert. Hello, are you listening to what the Bible is teaching us here about the painful experiences that are in store for a believer who is trying to conceal, to cover up, his or her sin, please notice very carefully that the Bible presents us with vivid descriptions of the painful experiences David went through 
during the days and weeks and months, he had tried hard to hide his sin. Just as David used three key Old Testament words for sin, in verse 1 and 2, he talks about sin, <laughs> transgression, iniquity, and three specific terms for forgiveness. He talks about my sin being covered, my sin being forgiven, and my, my sin being what? What was the third one? <coughs> Help me out here. Covered, covered, forgiven, and oh, the Lord does not impute iniquity to me. Okay, that's the third one. So, so now David tosses three specific painful experiences of his unrepentant state. That is, he's telling us at the time when he refused to repent, what happened <coughs> to him personally. The first painful experience is physical. That is why David said, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. The Hebrew word for body is a term. It also means bone, a bone of a living person or a bodily friend like I have standing before you or self. When it is used in the plural, it represents the entire person that is the whole person. You see, unconfessed sin was doing a number on David's body. When David kept silent, that is when he stubbornly refused to confess his sin, in order to have God forgive him, David's physical body wasted away through his groaning. That's another, wo another word for groaning is roaring. His body was roaring with pain. Earlier in Psalm 31, verse 10, David shares his experience of suffering bodily pain because of sin. It says in verse 10 of Psalm 31, For my life is spent with sorrow, and my years with sighing. My strength has failed because of my iniquity, and my body wasted away. The same word for body in Psalm 31 verse 10 is the same word in verse 32 verse, uh, chapter 32 verse 3. So now please don't get me wrong. I'm not teaching that every physical pain the believer goes through or experiences <coughs> is caused by sin. That's not what I'm teaching. But I'm just focusing on this passage which is talking to us about what David went through when he tried to conceal, to cover up his sin. In Psalm 32, verse 3, David tells us that the physical pain he experienced as a result of refusing to confess his sin was relentless. It went on all day. It was unrelenting. It was ongoing. Folks, may I warn you, if you refuse to confess your sins to Jesus, don't be surprised if God takes you to the woodshed for some physical spanking. Well, the second painful experience the Bible vividly describes is suffering under the heavy hand of God. And this is talking about psychological suffering. David says, for day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. The Hebrew word for heavy also means to be weighty or grievous or severe or to oppress. The main idea is to be heavy, which becomes sever severity. So whatever David experienced was not slight, but very, very severe. But now here is what I want you to understand. That God's heavy hand upon David was only intended to help David to come to the point of confession. This was not God trying to be mean to David. He was helping David to come to the point of confession. God was saying to David, you have been successful in hiding your sins from people. But I'm making my hand heavy upon you today until you own up to your sins and confess them to me. And until you do that, there will be no relief for you day and night. You see, David, the more David strove against confession, 
The louder the conscience speak, day and night, David's conscience bothered him. God's heavy hand of discipline lay heavy upon David day and night. The feeling of God's displeasure and hatred for his sins left David no rest. It was as if a fire burned within David which threatened to completely devour him. Folks, this is not pretty stuff, but it is practical. It is where the rubber meets the road in your life and my life. If I'm concealing sin in my life, I can expect physical pain, psychological pain. So this passage is challenging us to think twice before hiding our sins and stubbornly refusing to confess them to Jesus Christ. David says, I'm sharing my experience with you so that you and me will not repeat my mistake. That's why it is here in the Bible. Well, the third painful experience David suffered is the problem of spiritual dryness in David's life. David's personal life or spiritual life became dry and dull. Notice he says, my vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer, Sila. Sila means stop, pause, and listen closely to what God is saying. This verse literally reads, my life juices were turned into the drought of summer, Sila. So the Bible is saying David's spiritual life hit a snag. You see, unconfessed sin stops, sapped David's spiritual strength. His spiritual life was no longer vibrant, vigorous, and victorious. It was no longer moving in the right direction. It was dry, dull, and dim. It lost the shine. David's spiritual life was now simply a going through the motion. My friend, is that where you are today? Is your spiritual life just a going through the motion? If that's the case, listen to the rest of the story because it will encourage you. Actually, the word translated drained also means to turn over. It's like David is saying, my life was turned over. To turn around, to overturn, to change, to destroy. You see, as David's heart still remains unbroken over his sins, he compares God's dealings with him to a man scorched up and burnt up in the dry summer heat. I don't know about you, if you ever found yourself in a dry, hot desert with no water for days, then you understand a little bit of what David is saying here, what he went through when he concealed his sin, all because his heart remains unbroken over his sins. What about you today? Is your heart unbroken over your sins? Now the Bible brings us to the turning point in David's life. This is where the hope is for you and me. After days, weeks, and months of David's unbrokenness over his sins, he finally came to the point where he was willing to say, the three words that God had been waiting to hear from David. Can you guess what those three words are? I have sinned. That, that's, those were the words God was looking, looking for. So this brings us to the important point of David's personal decision to confess his sin in verse 5. Notice the Bible says, I acknowledge my sin to you. And my iniquity I did not hide. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Just as David used three words for sin, three terms for forgiveness, and three specific descriptions of his painful experiences during the time he was stubbornly unrepentant, so also now, he employs three specific terms in his personal confession. 
That is why this psalm is called a masculine or a skillful or contemplative psalm. Everything was carefully written. Notice first he says, I acknowledge my sin to you. That is, I made known or I announced my sin to you. The verb used here stresses recognition and declaration of a fact, whether it is good or bad. So David is declaring a fact to God that I acknowledge my sin to you. Second, he says, my iniquity I did not hide. David says, I'm no longer going to sweep it all under the rug. He says, I'm no longer going to cover and conceal my wrongdoing. I'm no longer going to gloss over my iniquity, or I'm no longer going to lessen the seriousness of my sin. I'm no longer going to make light of my sins. I'm no longer going to excuse my sin. I choose today to bring it all out in the open. Well, it's not 7 o'clock yet, my friend. They left him, though. Oh, okay. What? But it's not 7 o'clock. We, we close at 7. Confess your sins. All right, sir. Confess your sins. Confess your sins. Confess your sins. Okay, let's, let's continue. The third thing David says is that I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. You see, before the prodigal son came to his senses and made his resolve to return to his father's house and confess his sins, David also made the resolve to confess his transgressions to the Lord. What is confession? To confess our sin is to agree with God acknowledging that he is right to declare what we have done as sinful and that we are wrong to desire and to do it. It is to speak out about our sin and to call it by its real name. It is to affirm our intention of abandoning that sin in order to follow Jesus Christ more fully and faithfully. That is true, forgive, uh, through, uh, true confession. Last Friday, before I, came, I, I was preparing this message, a man called me to ask for prayer. And before he asked me for prayer, he said, I confess my sin of being involved in occultism, Satanism, and my desire to have power and to be rich and famous. He says, all these things were offered to me by Satan, but now I realize they are sinful. Therefore, I'm confessing them. All I want to do now is to follow Jesus Christ. That is true confession. If you are a true believer in Jesus Christ here today, but you are out of fellowship with God, like David was once when he covered up his sins, I ask you to do what David did. Recognize your sinfulness and tendency to do wrong. Realize that sin is rebellion against God. Repent by admitting your sins to God and turning away from it and rest in God's forgiveness for you. Remember his promise to you. If you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive you your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness and receive his forgiveness. And if you are a believer here today and you have need for prayer regarding family problems, even if you want healing, if you, have, if you want God's help to get you off the street to find a job, you can come forward here for prayer. But if you are not a believer in Jesus Christ, you've never put your trust in Jesus Christ, well, today you have to agree with Jesus that you are a sinner. Headed to hell, not to heaven. Acknowledge to Jesus that his death on the cross is the only way for you to be saved. And accept his free and full forgiveness for you today. And the Bible says you'll be saved. So if you need prayer as a believer for any other thing, maybe for forgiveness of your sins, or maybe for family problems, or maybe for financial help from God, a breakthrough, 
We are here to pray for you. But if you have never put your trust in Jesus Christ, you come to me and I'll pray with you. I know our study was abruptly ended, but God is here to minister to you. So don't live here without receiving prayer. Just pray for meal. Yeah, I'll pray for your meal. But if you want prayer, <coughs> don't live here. Heavenly Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for your ways that are not our ways. And we thank you for the service of this uh, rescue mission. We praise you for the people who serve here. Lord, we pray for the food that has been prepared for all the people here. We ask that you bless this food to the good of their bodies, even as they receive it today from your hands. Thank you that every good and perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of light, with whom there is no shadow of turning. And all God's people said, Amen. 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 That you will break the bondage of Satan. That you will lose the, 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 the you will lose the, the chains that the enemy is trying to put upon his upon his life to block him financially, to block his financial blessings to, 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 to him. I ask you today, Lord Jesus, in the power of your name, by the cross of Jesus Christ, you will defend my brother Robert. You will defeat the plans of Satan in his life. Lord, that you will open up windows of heaven to bless him. Because you are the God who promises to bless your people. And I pray, committing Robert to you, that you will guide his footsteps. Even tonight, guide his footsteps. Even tonight, be preparing maybe a job. Something that will open up the windows of heaven in his life. So that he can testify. My God, I pray to my God. And my God answered me. My God answered me. So I commit Robert to you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit, that you will protect, preserve, and provide for him, as only you can do for the glory of your name. Amen. There's always a way. Yeah, one, we can do that. We can do that right now.